Welcome to Farming Matters, a YouTube video series of the North Central SARE program where we get to talk with um, our SARE farmer rancher grantees and help elevate their stories and learn from them and hear what they learned um, from their SARE grant. I am really excited today. I'm with a, a couple of very special, special guests. Uh, my co-host, Marie Flanagan and producer of the show. Hello, Marie. Hello. And today we are excited to share um, and learn more from Jeremy Motator, who is the farm manager at Michigan Michigan's um, Campus Farm. And Jeremy, I'll let you share more about a little what led you to your project idea and kind of what came out of that. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me today. And yeah, so I'm the program manager, farm manager here at the University of Michigan Campus Farm, which is part of the Mathai Botanical Gardens. Um, you can see the, the one of the farm fields behind me in my video. Um, so we're a diversified vegetable uh, farm that's a very um, living learning lab, student-led space on campus. The farm produces food for our dining halls, for a farm stand on campus, and for um, the Maize and Blue Cupboard uh, food pantry on campus. Um, so as a kind of living learning lab for sustainable food system student-led farm, um, when a group of students came to me and were um, very interested in um, uh, they saw the opportunity to do a SARE, uh, small sale grant uh, and kind of explore something that they were really interested in, which was mushrooms. Um, we sat down and talked a little bit about like what, what might be a unique and interesting project to do that involved mushrooms. And um, one of the things that I think uh, has, is important and as folks who are running diversified small scale farms know, and I used to run an organic farmer uh, training program at the other university up the road, Michigan State for 10 years. And, um, you know, I was thinking about when you have a fixed resource, um, that's a fixed cost resource, uh, anytime you can have that resource um, make more production uh, in a kind of value add way, it's useful. So, uh, Transplant production, which is kind of for most, you know, diversified farms or especially eco ecological or organic farms that are growing their own transplants. When you fire up your greenhouse and turn it on and start paying to heat it, um, <laughs> as much money as could come out of that heating expense is desirable. And so we are thinking a little bit about, you know, we already fill our, our greenhouse full of transplants, uh, both for on-farm use and for sale. Um, but the question was, is there a way to utilize the space underneath our growing tables to have an additional um, supplemental crop um, of mushrooms? Students um, who I worked with, um, Annabelle and Lauren, they, um, they created this uh, zine to basically um, share about the report. Um, it's uploaded to the SARA site and was distributed to farmers in the area as well. They, they really took a lot of creative passion to this project, and they also um, did all the actual uh, physical work that I'm going to describe, and um, I advised and mentored them and helped us think through the various ins and outs as we went along and helped with the reporting. So um, just a shout out to Annabelle and Lauren. Um, we used a, a couple, they wanted to try out a few different kinds of mushrooms, right? We, we, we didn't know which ones would work best, so we tried... Um, three different types in um, a couple of different production schemes. So we used a wine cap or a composter mushroom, which um, can grow in um, uh, sawdust or uh, wood chips that we had on site from chipping up some invasives like buckthorn wood chips when we were just getting rid of some buckthorn. Um, but we also tried oyster logs, uh, oysters on logs oysters in kind of a stacked totem system, like you can see down here in the bottom of my screen. And then we tried shiitakes in um, plugs. So here's a, a diagram picture from before the experiment, of those different kinds of things. So we had three different types of mushrooms and a few different types of growing methods to try to see which ones might work better. So you can see that with the um, shiitakes, we used um, you know, oak logs, um, varying diameters, because we use what we could get our hands on of freshly cut um, white oak. So, um, and then um, uh, used plugs and um, uh, cheese wax to close those up in a, in a, in a drill to, to put the plugs in. With the um, totems down here in the lower left, we use those stacks um, and then we use a sawdust-based inoculum 
and had those in bags until the mycelium was running kind of fairly well on them. And then we use, here's an example, a great picture showing both the um, thorn wood chips as well as the um, just uh, wheat straw for the um, compost or mushrooms. You can see here a few of those different applications and some of the mycelial runs and a little bit of um, fruit germination and um, our fruit germination for fruit initiation as well as some fruit production. We ended up soaking the shiitake logs to force some fruiting and uh, that worked reasonably well. And I'll talk a little bit more about the overall timeline for this process and what some of the things that I think we did well and what some of the things that didn't work so well. So I'll stick here maybe um, with these pictures or maybe I'll actually pipe back up to this one because it shows these different treatments and I can kind of narrate the pros and cons of what we did in each one. So by the timing of the grant, we essentially ended up a little bit later into the season of, for getting things off the ground than we had intended. Um, but we did have enough time in the second season to kind of retry a, a timeline more akin to our original idea. And um, I, I think in the end, I would recommend a timeline that was even different than either of those. But the idea of having the mushrooms there and fruiting at the time when um, that would maybe be out of sync or an early market for these mushrooms earlier than you might get in the outdoor production that might potentially carry with it some, you know, price premium, uh, depending on the market avenue you were choosing. We um, we set out to, to think about how that could work that way. We know that our transplant tables are most, most full of transplants in the spring. And so we basically inoculated these plants and, uh, uh, inoculated the substrates and put them under our tables. But the challenge was that our hoop house, our, our greenhouse production spaces, and ours happens to be a glass house, but it would be the same in a hoop house, I think. Um, it just, it's a, it's too, it was too hot in the summer. Like we got some mycelium runs and then things kind of went dormant. We probably could have with more active management attempted to keep them, we did keep them watered, but we probably didn't keep them watered quite uh, enough, or just the, the truth is that the environmental conditions in there just weren't really um, appropriate. So we tried a couple of different timings the next year with relying mostly on the wine caps, uh, because we thought that in the end that that might be a more farmer friendly production system, because it's, um, because there's no logs and, you know, it's like putting a substrate under, it's pretty easy to come by a couple of bales of straw to put under your three tables. It's harder to come by some of those other, um, some of that other oak, infra, uh, oak logs and things like that. And just kind of was cumbersome to get that stuff in and out and under, out from under our tables. But even then when we seeded them in the spring or in the closer to our original timeline, which was like December, January, we still found that um, by the time we had a good mycelial run, we the temperatures in the greenhouse still became kind of inappropriately hot, uh, even using warm season um, strains of the spawns, of the different spawns. We did have uh, the, some success with the shiitakes, and you can see that in, in um, kind of these pictures here, where the mycelial runs we did see in the winter, um, when we had started to fire the greenhouse back up again in year two, we noticed that the shiitake logs had started to fruit some out of the bottom where those logs were contacting the soil at the base of the greenhouse and where more moisture was accumulating. So we were like, well, let's see if those runs, if that mycelial run is just in there, but it's been too dry to fruit. So we force fruited them um, by soaking them uh uh, basically 24 hours in a tank. And what we discovered was that although those logs seemed, uh, we weren't sure how good the mycelium run was, there were mycelium in there throughout the log and we did get fruit along the entire uh, length of the log after we force fruited it. But one of the things that we realized through that was that it was silly of us and anyone who was really into mushroom productions would have been like, guys, I could have told you that. And, uh, you know, sometimes things are hindsight. You know, we we stored them as per our drawings here in the um, 
in the lower right there in basically a fruiting position, right? And we did that because I don't know, that's how we drew it. And we thought, hey, look at that. We'll cut them in these lengths. They'll fit right there really well. I think we should have stored them, although it would have been more moving, we should have stored them completely flat to the ground in basically a more typical yard formation to increase, to decrease the solar irradiation and decrease the amount of drying and wind that they got. And then when we wanted to fruit them, put them up into, um, uh, the fruiting stance like that. And that probably would have also allowed us to put more logs under the tables if we had wanted. In addition to that, you can see the great variation in diameter of the logs that we used. If I were to do this again, although this wouldn't give you the longest run of mushrooms, I would probably only do pretty small four inch diameter or less logs because that big log you can see there in the lower right, it's, it's not fun or reasonable to get that in or out from under a table. It's just not uh, really a, appropriate for a system like this, um, whereas it might be in a woodlot or something. So I would I would stick with kind of smaller uh, logs if I was gonna try to do it with um, shiitakes. The totems we had the worst luck with, I think because they just, although we pulled the bags off after the mycelium run happened, that the, they were the most susceptible to drying because of just the architecture of the way the totem stack was. So we just didn't get a good um, mycelium run in those. And, and so we, I don't have a lot to add there other than it seems like that isn't that's probably the least compatible like style of production, I would say, that we experienced with having them under the greenhouse tables. We messed around with shade cloths over the tables after we were at a time of the year when the transplants weren't there, we had shade cloth around. And so we just threw shade cloth over the tables when the tables didn't have transplants on them anymore to just try to reduce some of that solar radiation. But I think that didn't change the fact that the ambient air temperature in there often exceeded 100 degrees. Um, so, you know, mushrooms don't like that. So, um in the end, I think if we, um, I still think that it's a potentially um, viable project. I think the shiitakes kind of could work, it seems, based on what we found on, almost, on most any timeline, although I would probably recommend the following timeline based on what we discovered. I think inoculation in the early fall um, actually when the house, you may not be using your transplant production house at this time, or, you know, you may be, you're storing stuff in it or whatever, the, all the kinds of things that we do with transplant houses when they're not growing transplants, um, using them as wash pack stations or whatever else we do that, um, I think inoculation in, um, say October one in, in, you know, we're in Southern Michigan or sometime when the temperatures in that hoop house or that greenhouse transplant greenhouse are starting to come off that really high edge. For us, it's like kind of the same window where we might successfully germinate spinach in our passive solar hoop houses, just where it's, you're not getting those really hot daytime temperatures. You don't have the heat on in there at that time, but if you could initiate that mycelium run as the greenhouse was warmer, that would be too late really probably to initiate it successfully outdoors or isn't when most people would do it, but you could, use the runway, so to speak, of the extra warmth that you get in the uh, October and November and early December window, just because you're undercover, um, to hopefully get a nice run of the mycelium when the temperature in the greenhouse, even with the heat off, is a little bit more like the an extended prolonged fall. And then um, I think the timing would work best then once you have the added moisture and the you turn the heat on, you know, depending on what crops you're going in January or February, um, for those mycelium to wake back up and potentially ideally set fruit then in maybe April before it gets so hot that then they go dormant again. And I think the dormancy with the shiitake logs would just be dormant, dormancy as long as you didn't get so dry that they died. Um, and they probably would wake back up and flush again in the future. My guess is that with the straw-based wine caps, that system would probably, it might look more like a one and done. I'm not sure. You might, you know, inoculate in the fall, flush your mushrooms off that straw in the spring, and then reset the program. I'm, I'm not sure if it would make it for a second run or if it would just get too dry and too hot under that in the straw in the, in the greenhouse. 
The other thing is I would recommend the straw because I think over the wood chips, because although people use wood chips for a more durable, like longer term, like my like fruiting window and mycelium run from um, wine caps, I think in this setting, you're tr the better fit is something that feels more like a, a fast crop, like a, what I call in vegetable production, like a cheater crop, where I've, I've put something in between where there is two things that are supposed to be there, but now I've got radishes when I didn't have radishes before because they just can basically cheat off book and be uh, <laughs> fit in between two things that are uh, on the actual schedule. So in that sense, um, I think the straw just is a little bit better fit from that because you get a faster mycelium run and um, I think in turn, probably a faster fruiting turnaround. So that was a lot of words all at once um, in a, kind of a, a wild overview. Um, I'll just click to the end there. You can see the cute picture of after we had soaked the logs of um, the shiitake starting to come out and they're, they're a nice quality and we didn't have any pest pressure or issues in there. It's a pretty clean and controlled environment uh, and there's not a lot of mushroom pests um, because it's not that wet or uh, comfortable for the kinds of things that might eat mushrooms. So, um, you know, that's, I'm going to stop the screen share and um, see if you have additional follow-up questions, Erin or Marie, to guide us in the conversation? Oh, well, thank you that just taking us through those mycelial threads of your project and how that went. That was one um, one thing I was really, that drew me to, you know, or just like I teased out from your listening to you talk a little was, was one about like that notion of scale and really thinking like, so after going through and trying this out and hopefully the grant helps support some of that risk taking and learning. Um, sure. What would you offer up as kind of your sweet spot for scale or would you, do you think you'd do it again or like, or for some ones who wanted to try it? Yeah. Like for someone, for someone who wanted to try it, I think the sweet spot for scale, I think it depends a little bit on how your transplant greenhouse is set up, mm -hmm. but um, a lot of people have fabric on the floor of their houses. So mm -hmm. We did some over fabric and some where we removed the fabric. So there was direct soil contact. I am not sure that mattered a ton of uh, the difference between those two things. It may have mattered more for the wine caps. I don't think the shiitakes cared at all because they weren't really <laughs> the way that we had them. I don't think it would have affected it. Um, I would say if someone is looking for something that is kind of more of a little bit of a I hate to say this because I don't think this is true for really anything, even though that like set it and forget it kind of idea. I mm -hmm. think the shiitakes might on some level provide a little bit more of that in the sense that you could have them there. They didn't seem to, even though they went dormant, as long as the run successfully happened when they went dormant, when it was too hot, that's part of their normal cycle. They go mm -hmm. dormant when it's hot. They didn't die. They went dormant and then we could wake them up when we wanted through flushing. Uh, and you might find that they wake up naturally in the fall if you like, you know, run some over it. We we considered putting irrigation in there, which is funny, which we didn't do. We just kind of threw some water down on them with our water <laughs> once in a while. But we could have put some, you know, some irrigation in there. Again, this gets back to like the scale issue. I think it gets a little complicated is mm. if your main gig is vegetable production and your main gig is vegetable and transplant production. <laughs> then uh, you probably don't take care of the mushrooms as well as you would if you were like, you know, certainly people who are watching this who are mushroom folks will be like, you know, these, it's a little bit crazy what we did. But uh, I think that there's still an opportunity there um, to have something that could be a lower scale background management kind of, like I said, bonus kind of crop. I think you probably either need to treat it that way and have go really low maintenance with reasonably low expectations on the suggested timelines that I have, or decide that you, that this is a, you're going to up your game and you're going to basically uh, be both a mushroom farmer and a vegetable diversified vegetable farmer. And you're going to, you're going to attend to those mushrooms, which are in this space as you would anything else in your plan. The idea that they would just kind of like be under there and, you know, make a bonus crop, I think was probably a little bit like, you know, opt overly optimistic. Um, but uh, so I think that that's one thing that I would say in reflection on scale. But I think if I was to do it, 
um, I don't know. I'm a little bit drawn to the idea. I'd like to try it again and do it with the with the chate- with the wine caps, with the full inoculated wine caps on straw, because I feel like it's not heavy, it's not complicated, it's easy to source wine cap straw spawn, and it's easy to source wheat straw in the fall, especially. Throw some bales underneath there, inoculate it, water them in, and see if we maybe that version uh, gets us that low maintenance spring flush of uh, wine cap or composter as some people call them mushrooms um i think so i think the shiitake logs would almost always have to be um probably forced uh i'm not sure that the ambient so the other idea that we had was that right like was not just dual use of the space, but dual use of the water, right? When the water flows off the transplants and down onto the ground, it's fine. It's not hurting anything. But um, we were like, well, what if that water could be utilized by another crop, you know? But I, we don't overwater our transplants because we're not trying to nutrient leach them. So I think that for the shiitakes, at least, the probably fruit fruiting might be uh dependent on forcing. Whereas I think the straw gets enough like flow through from the overhead to kind of stay moist and pro- and produce a, a fruiting crop. So that's, I guess, what I would say about scale and management style. It's like, how how all in are you trying to get? It's an asset to have our season extension as farmers for like hoop houses and greenhouses, but then you're like left with this real estate. And I just appreciate how you all took that innovation and you know, yeah, I mean, that's what it feels like for, for so much stuff. And I think I think <laughs> about that. And and I guess I, I think about that a lot in a lot of different contexts, right? It's the same thing. You can make that argument for any fixed piece mm-hmm. of infrastructure, whether it's your walking cooler or your tractor, or, you know, if you only use it five hours a year, then I don't know, it's expensive uh, mm-hmm. on a per hour basis or per acre basis or whatever. But everything I think is in the context of like that, um, trying to squeeze something in that's kind of off playbook or off crop mm-hmm. schedule or whatever, I think there's also just um, like you brought up a really good point. There's scale issues there, right? So at some level, doing something like that's almost for free, right? You sneak this thing in, it's kind of a side project and, and you get something almost for what feels like nothing. Mm-hmm. But at the point that you scale that, there's a there's a limited scale window there because when you turn up the volume enough, then it actually is no longer something that's extra. It's just a thing. And once it's a thing, then you're it's fine. But it's now now I'm like making this other I have this other uh, enterprise. Well, Jeremy, we you've been really super generous with your with your time and sharing sharing like your project and taking us to to both the greenhouse and to your farm and like a window into that world. Um, is there anything else that w- that you'd want to just share like it's giving you heartburn or like makes your heart sing? Uh, no, I mean, I think I just want to give a shout out to Sarah. I mean, honestly, I think the fact that you guys are as uh, supportive as you are uh, is amazing. And I think that you take some of that risk uh, out of there and help farmers try to innovate and share those innovations out with other farmers. I think that's some of the best learning that we can do. I know that you both believe that or you probably wouldn't work at Sarah, um, <laughs> but I um but I just, if you're watching this and you are thinking, ah, it's 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 set up to work for farmers, and uh, I I value and appreciate that, and so I I value the resource that this is and the opportunity that it creates for for both like folks like who are my students and you know folks who are farming every day. So thank you all. Thank you. Cool.